Well, HTBB is now seven months old. And um, it's amazing to think of all that's happened in the last few months. It, it's mind-blowing, really. And um, Sarah and I have been overwhelmed by the passion, the generosity, and, well, quite frankly, brilliance of you, the congregation. We cannot thank you enough for all that you've done so far. And the vision of HTBB is no small thing. Our vision is to play our part in the evangelization of the nations and the transformation of society. And such a vision can only become a reality if every single one of us, everyone is praying. And that's why in the middle of June, we will launch our prayer room, which will be situated just round behind the cafe. Everyone praying, everyone serving. And I'm so thankful for the way so many of you serve here on a Sunday and then at Alpha on Wednesdays, the marriage course on Thursdays and connect groups, social action projects. Thank you. So everyone praying, everyone serving, but also the vision requires everyone giving. And that's why uh, today is our first gift day here at HTBB. And I'm really excited about today because today is not just an opportunity for fundraising, but also an opportunity for faith raising. Do you know, there are 2,350 verses in the Bible about money. That's twice as many verses as there are about faith and prayer combined. 15% of the recorded words of Jesus in the New Testament were on this topic. So this suggests that God thinks this is pretty important. But it's not because God is obsessed with money. It's because he's obsessed with generosity. John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. So I'd love us today to look at some reasons why, five reasons, why giving is an important thing for you and me to do. And our reading is taken from Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4, verses 10 to 19. Let's read together. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Philippi. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Not that I'm looking for a gift, but I'm looking for what may be credited to your account. I've received full payment and even more. I am amply supplied now that I've received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. The first reason why it's good to give is because giving is an act of worship. In response to the gifts that the Philippians have given, Paul says in verse 18 that they are a fragrant offering, pleasing to God. Giving is a practical way in which we can place God first in the priorities of our life. And if you like, that, that is a sort of definition of worship. It's to place God first. And in the Old Testament, the, the people of God understood this. You see, it says in Leviticus 27, this. 
a tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. So they gave a tithe, which was 10% of their income, to the Lord as an act of worship. Actually, if I'm being precise, they didn't give the tithe, they repaid the tithe because they understood that it belonged to the Lord. And if they didn't tithe, they were robbing him. And tithing gave them a sort of perspective. It helped them understand what the psalmist says in Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. It's as if everything that you and I will ever see or touch in this world is stamped with the word God's. Our, our friend, um, J. John, who he came here, didn't he, to speak one evening on the last Alpha course that we had here. J. John was telling me about this time when he was catching a, a flight. So he'd gone to the airport, he checked in, and he had a bit of time, so he went to a cafe there at the airport. And he bought a cup of coffee and a bag of small donuts. And uh, he was, it was very busy in the cafe, so he was looking for somewhere to sit. And there was only one seat left, which was on a table for two. And there was one man sitting at the table. So he said to the man, do you mind if I sit here? And the man said, certainly. So J. John sat down, put his bags down, um, had a sip of his coffee. And then to his amazement, without saying anything, the man sitting opposite him just put his hand into the bag on the table, took out a donut, and ate it. And J. John thought, he's eating my donuts. He didn't even ask. So to make a point, J. John looked straight at him, put his hand in the bag, pulled out a donut, and ate it. Well, a few minutes later, to his shock, the man leant over again, put a hand in the bag, smiled, took out the donut, and ate it. J. John thought, I've got to do something. So he took the bag and he moved it closer to his side of the table, took out a donut, and ate it. Well, a few minutes passed, and then the man, again, smiling, leant across the table, ripped open the bag, took a donut, and ate it. J. John thought, I'm going to have to act here. So he grabbed the last two remaining donuts and put them both in his mouth <laughs> at the same time. Uh, a few minutes passed. The man stood up, said goodbye, smiled, waved, and left. J. John thought, I can't believe the cheek of it. Finished his coffee, went to pick up his bags, and there on top of his bag lifted up his bag of donuts. <laughs> the realization the man had not been taking his donuts. He'd been generously sharing them with J. John. So here's the point. God owns all the donuts. And when we realize that God owns all the donuts, then sharing them with him seems the obvious thing to do. This was the perspective they had. And the stated purpose of tithing in the Old Testament is clear. It says in Deuteronomy 14 that tithing was that you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. And of course, because they gave 10%, to tithe required calculation. They had to quite literally count their blessings. And this led to a heart of thankfulness and in turn, a heart of worship. And the tithe came from, well, they gave from the first fruits of the land. It was not just to do about the quantity of what they gave, but also the quality. And then on top of the tithe, the people of Israel also gave what the Old Testament calls free will offerings. These were offerings that they gave as an act of worship and in response to need. Classic example, Exodus chapter 36. Um, they want to build the sanctuary. There's a clear need. 
So the people start bringing free will offerings as an act of worship and in response to that need. And they keep coming. And they keep coming. In fact, they keep bringing so many offerings, it goes far beyond that which they need. Moses is overwhelmed. And he has to say to them, okay, thank you, but time out. Can you please stop giving? This is like every pastor's dream scenario. These were free will offerings. And Paul here in Philippians says to them that their giving is also an act of worship, a fragrant offering to the Lord. Martin Luther said this, every Christian requires three conversions, a conversion of the heart, of the mind, and of the purse. It's an act of worship. The second reason why it's good to give is because giving releases blessing in our lives. In response to their giving, Paul says this in verse 19, and my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Throughout the Bible, we're told not to test God. Deuteronomy, do not put the Lord your God to the test. But once, just once in scripture, we are told to test God. It's in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. It says this, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me. In this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have enough room for it. We can't outgive God. He is no person's debtor. Jesus in Luke 6 says, give and it will be given to you. For the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Giving releases blessing in our lives. Now, let's be clear. That blessing may not be financial. This is not a prosperity gospel. But please be clear. If you give, you are always blessed. And I'm often asked, okay, Miles, so how much should I give? Well, the early church said, we are free. Jesus has set us free from the Old Testament law. So we no longer have to give the tithe. We're free to give as much as we want. And that is true. And we are just as free. We are free from the law. But in response to all that God had given them in Jesus, the early church gave more. Irenaeus, the early church father in the second century AD, said this. The Jews were constrained to a regular payment of tithes. Christians who have liberty assign all their possessions to the Lord, bestowing freely not the lesser portions of their property, since they have the hope of greater things. My own personal view, for what it's worth, is that tithing, 10%, is a really helpful guideline. But tithing is not the finishing line of giving. It's the starting blocks. We certainly wouldn't want to give less than 10%. And I suppose it can be helpful to try and apply the principle of stretch to our giving. You know, each year, Sarah and I sort of want to, under God, become a little bit better. Better parents, better friends, better givers. And each year we'll try and stretch our giving that little bit more. It's a bit like stretching a hamstring. You sort of stretch until it gets uh, a bit tight, might hurt a little. And the next time you can stretch a bit more. It's the principle of stretch. But remember, each time we do give or stretch that bit more, it always releases blessing in our lives. That's the second reason why it's good to give. The third, and I'm going to spend the 
the most focus is on this. Giving is good because it releases blessing in other people's lives. Verse 14, Paul writes to the Philippians, yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. So Paul is writing this letter to them from prison. And actually, Paul is on death row. And in prison, he wouldn't be fed. In fact, he'd only eat if others supplied his need. And that's what the Philippians are doing. He says to them, before you shared in God's grace with me, now you're sharing in my troubles. And throughout history, Christians have always blessed others through their giving. Rodney Stark, who is the um, teacher of sociology at Princeton University, he studied and asked this question, how was it that in just three centuries, Christianity could spread throughout the whole of the Greco-Roman world without any recourse to violence or conflict? And his conclusion was this, it's because they were so different, so distinctive. And in particular, in this area of giving and blessing others. Emperor Julian, who was the, he was a Roman emperor known for his vicious persecution of the Christians. He wrote this to his civil servants. If we are to purge our empire of Christianity, we have got to stimulate our people to give to the poor like the Christians do. For they look after their own poor and ours as well. The vision here at HTBB is to play our part in the evangelization of the nations and the transformation of society. And part of the way in which we do that, as you know, is through um, Alpha, enabling uh, this amazing tool Alpha to uh, other churches to be trained in how to run it, equipped so that they can bless others too. And Alpha is a course designed primarily for those uh, outside of the church to come and ask uh, life's big questions and to explore the basics of the Christian faith. And what's so amazing is the Lord has really blessed this and blown it along by His Spirit. And to date, about 27 million people have been through Alpha around the world and had therefore the chance, 27 million people, the chance to encounter Jesus. So exciting. And uh, last year, of all the people around the world who did Alpha, about 2.5 million, 54% of them were in Asia. This is where it's growing the most strongly. Take India, just one country, India. Last year in India, one million Indians went through Alpha to explore a relationship with Jesus. Indonesia, quarter of a billion people were looking to see the work there grow very rapidly this year. China, we're operating in China uh, not just with house churches, but with the state church as well. We're operating in 13 provinces, our work across China. And through another one of our resources, the marriage course, we are endorsed by the Civil Affairs Bureau there. The, the course is printed in Chinese, in China. The local government refers couples to us. You almost have to pinch yourself to believe it. Vietnam. Another huge communist country, 100 million people. Recently, the president of the entire uh, ch churches in the north of Vietnam has invited us in. Just last week, we did our first ever training of pastors in Hanoi. This thing is growing and growing. And what's our role here? Well, this local church here is also the hub, the Asia Pacific hub. All of this work across this amazing continent is coordinated and led from here. That's why, as you saw on HTBB News, we have this week coming up in June 
where we'll have around 100 pastors from across the region coming here to be trained and equipped to run Alpha. They'll come here on the Wednesday night to experience our own course here at HTBB. And then they'll go back to their countries and then teach others how to run it. This is so exciting. And whatever is given throughout the day today, we want to give a chunk of that to this work across the whole of Asia. But also, whatever we raise today is going to the work here of this place as a local church as well. So far, we've run two rounds of Alpha here. We've had about 200 people on each run. The next one starts on the 13th of May. And if you've never done Alpha before um, and would like to, I'd love to invite you to come along on that. And then also um, the marriage course. You know, this is so important. One divorce happens in Malaysia every 10 minutes. And we've run one round of the marriage course here. It's not just for struggling marriages, but those that are good as well to help make them even stronger. And we had 15 couples on our first round, and we start again on the 4th of June. Again, you're, you're invited to come and attend. And then social action. We're just beginning to, well, it looks like we're going to partner uh, with, with this project just down the road um, to begin a, a community learning center for those who struggle to access uh, education. Things are cropping up for us to invest in. And I think there are a couple of myths, as it were, about HTBB. One is that we're a rich church. Well, we don't hold any reserves. Our reserves are in your pockets, the pockets of the congregation. And in that sense, we're completely, well, we are rich in that sense. Um, but you could stop this whole vision today if you didn't give. We are completely reliant on you. And therefore, we're completely reliant on God. And that's the way we like it. And the good thing is that we are generously given this amazing space rent-free. And that means that the vast majority of everything that is given goes into frontline ministry. To date, about 70% of our expenditure has gone into mission and evangelism. The second thing that sometimes people think is that we get money from the sale of Alpha resources. That's not true. Actually, the resources, um, yeah, we, want, we, we, we want to give this thing away. And the resources we sell either at cost price or below. And increasingly, we just give it away by making it free, downloadable via alpha.org. And then the other thing sometimes people say to me is, Miles, this vision is so big, my small contribution can't make a difference. Well, it's true, the vision is big. But however small your contribution, it makes a huge difference. Every cent given can change lives. Today, each one of us can become a stakeholder in transforming the world. HTBB can become like a, a blessing machine. We're blessed so that we can be a blessing to countless others. That's the third reason why it's good to give. The fourth reason is because giving is the best long-term investment you can make. Paul says in verse 15 that out of all the churches he's planted, only one supported him consistently in his need. That was the Philippians. And the way society sort of worked at that time was, um, let's say I needed some money. You would lend me some money and I would be indebted to you. And then when I could, I would then pay the money back to you plus a little bit more so that you were now indebted to me. And then eventually you would pay it back plus a little bit more. And that's the way it went. It's a bit like if somebody, say, has you round to their house for dinner or they take you out for dinner. You know, you always feel a little bit guilty until you've had them back and given them a slightly better meal. <laughs> That's the way it worked. And now that the Philippians had supplied Paul's need, what does he say to them? 
I now owe you big time? No. He says this, verse 17. I am looking for what may be credited to your account. What's he saying? Well, he's saying, now that you've given to me, God owes you. Because when you gave to me, you gave to him. That's why later on he says, now my God will supply all of your needs. In other words, Paul understood that by giving, the Philippians were storing up treasure in heaven. And this is what Jesus had said, hadn't he, on the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6. Jesus says, don't store up your treasure on earth where rust and moth can destroy or thieves can steal. Rather, store up your treasure in heaven where it's safe. Jesus wasn't saying it's wrong to invest. He was saying it's right to invest. Just invest it in the right place. In other words, you can't take your treasure with you but you can send it on ahead of you. And Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I don't know know about you, but I think sometimes we, we think of it the other way around. We think, okay, where's my heart at? What am I passionate about? Okay, I'll give to that. But Jesus says, try it the other way around. In other words, today, if you want to get passionate about and committed to HTBB and the vision, then invest in it and your heart will follow your investment. Like any good investor, you follow your investment. Martin Luther put it this way, again, brilliantly. He said, I have held many things in my hands and I've lost them all. But whatever I have placed in God's hands that I still possess. Giving is a good thing to do because it's an act of worship. It releases blessing in our lives. It releases blessing in other people's lives. It's the best long-term investment we can make. And fifthly and finally, giving is a good thing to do because it sets you free. It sets you free. And I have to remind myself of this. I think I'm somebody who naturally worries about money. In the parable of the sower, Jesus said that some of the plants that grow, thorns come and choke the life out of the plant. And he explains how the thorns represents the worries, and deceitfulness of wealth. And giving is a way in which we can pull out the thorns by the root. And that brings freedom that we can breathe again. And Jesus elsewhere says you can't serve two gods, God and mammon. Mammon was the god of money. And what he was saying here was that as we... and throne God in our lives. In that process, we have to dethrone the other gods in our lives to be free. I suppose an analogy of this would perhaps be, I don't know whether you remember what it was like to learn to ride a bicycle. I remember when I was learning to ride a bicycle, there came that day when my parents decided it's time to take off the stabilizers. And think of the stabilizers almost as your, the things that you, you put your security in, maybe wealth or something else. And when you take those stabilizers off, I remember I, it feels a bit wobbly. <laughs> but my father ran behind me. He didn't touch me, but he, he said, look, I'm there, I'm there. You're okay, keep going, keep going, keep going. You can trust me, I'm there. And I wobbled a bit more, but then eventually... Once you master it, there's this new freedom and adventure to riding a bike. And giving sets us free from fear as we trust our Father who's there with us, the Holy Spirit 
runs alongside. Literally, the, parac- the word for Holy Spirit, paraclete, means the one who calls alongside. Because we trust our Father. You know, Jesus always called God Father, except on just one occasion when he was on the cross. And quoting Psalm 22, he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was a cry of pain, the pain of separation from his Father in heaven. And he went through that pain of separation in order that we would no longer have to be separated from God, but we would know the presence of our loving Father in heaven who says, I love you, do not fear, you can trust me. And giving is a way that helps drive the truth of this deep into the very core of our being and sets us free from worry. Amen. So, amen. What we're going to do now is hopefully there was an, uh, an envelope on your chair when you came in. And um, I have to say, if you're a guest here today, or it's your first time uh, you've ever been here, then please do not feel pressurized in any way to give. If you want to, fantastic. But don't feel pressurized. Uh, And if it is your first time, hopefully it's been a a helpful uh, Sunday to come to. We don't do a gift day every day, hopefully just once a year. Um, But hopefully you've had a chance to hear a bit about the vision. And on the back, it says the ways in which we can give. So you can give either by cash or if you want to make out a check, it says there, make it out to Holy Trinity uh, Bukit Bintang. Or you can do uh, an online transfer. And the way that Sarah and I choose to do our giving is through a standing order. So we, we set it up with the bank. So each week, we, we know what's being, each month rather, we know what's being uh, given. And it also helps us as a church because then we can plan because we know roughly what's guaranteed income each month. And if you want to give by standing order, you just put in your name, uh, email or telephone, and then we can um, contact you if you want to help um, you have all the details to set it up. But you've got our, you've got our bank details there if you want to set it up. Um, or if you already give regularly, you might want to just give uh, an additional offering Uh, today. So what we're going to do is just take a moment now to pray and just ask the Lord, Lord, what would you like me to give? And then after that, we'll have a time of giving. So let's just spend a, a few moments now.